This is Shelton cassette number 32, a talk by Dr. Herbert M. Shelton. It was recorded at the Henry Hudson Hotel in New York City in July 1957. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have a rare treat. You're all familiar with a man who has stood head and shoulders above everyone else, I believe, in this field. He is a modern prophet, a man who took the philosophy of natural hygiene when it lay dormant, apparently dead to the world where the medical fraternity had relegated it to. He picked it up, gave it life, dynamic energy, brought it, gave it substance, and gave us life and a new vista on looking on all things. He is a man who has had the outstanding courage and conviction to fight for what he thought was correct. A man who is outstanding in the field of natural hygiene, second to none. It gives me great pleasure to give you Dr. Shelton. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, if I may make a little remark concerning something that the chairman said in introducing me, I would say that the only thing rare about me is that I'm not well done. <clears throat> Takes them a long time. Some of you must be English. Uh, I guess that was it. <laughs> so this evening I'm going to discuss with, this, uh, with you the subject of food combining. And I, I know that many of you have already been told, and if you discuss it hereafter, many of you are going to be told that there's nothing to it. There never is anything to anything new until it has been thoroughly tested and tried on a large scale and accepted by the people and forced upon the know-it-all. And then they discover that they discovered it. That they knew it all the time. The fact is that throughout their history, they have always followed one rule. First denounce everything and then claim everything. Last evening I began my talk by pointing out to you that the period of time that mankind existed on the earth prior to the beginning of civilization was many times the period of time that he has been civilized and that during that long period of time, man got along without the know-it-alls. He got along without physicians and drugs and serums and vaccines and surgery. He was born with all the knowledge he needed to live. Can you imagine an elephant consulting a, a psychiatrist? Or a deer having his appendix removed? I'm not sure that a deer has an appendix. <laughs> but anyhow, we'll assume that for the sake of the illustration, he has one. Can you think of the animals in nature consulting physicians and dentists and eye specialists and having their noses straddled with eye crutches? They were born with all the knowledge they needed to live. And so was man. And so is man. He is born today with all the instinctive equipment required to live and live healthfully. But we get, begin the process of destroying that e instinctive equipment and substituting it with false knowledge almost 
by the time the baby emerges from the womb. We have what we call an educational system that is dedicated primarily to misinforming the students, to conditioning them and making them contented cows, making them happy to be exploited by all the agents of exploitation that have been brought into existence by this crazy capitalistic system of ours. It is the forces of exploitation that tell you that the instinctive practices of man and animal have no value. That you should follow the lines laid down to you by the men out in the laboratories, by the scientists. Now, a scientist is a man who knows. In contrast to you ignoramuses who don't know. That's the difference between you. They know and you don't. Only the trouble with what they know is that most of it isn't so. And I believe it was Mark Twain who asked the question, what is the, re what is the use of knowing so much if what you know isn't so? I believe it was Bill Nye who made the remark... I believe it was Bill Nye who made the remark that most people spend their lives in the accumulation of ignorance. I'm going to add to that and point out that most people spend a large part of their lives palliating the symptoms that result from following their ignorance. Millions of dollars are spent every year in this country are those boons to mankind, Alka Seltzer, Tums, Bellan, Pepto Bismol, and other things of that kind, with which you palliate your symptoms, symptoms of indigestion, many of which are caused exclusively by wrong combinations of food. Now, please do not understand me to say that wrong food combining is the only cause of indigestion but it is one of the most common causes. And as a matter of fact, our modern eating habits, habits that we have adopted within the last 200 years, are so contrary to the normal eating habits of man that he has carried out from long periods of time before history began and on down through the early periods of history, and in some parts of the earth, even yet, these are the backward sections of the earth. They're so backward that they don't even have physicians. It's even worse than that. They're so backward that they don't even need physicians. So to make clear to you why the simple eating habits that so-called primitives of today and the animal world carry out provide for better digestion, let us go to the laboratory for a minute and get some of the knowledge of the know-it-all that they completely ignore or deny the value of in offering you their information. They will tell you that the human digestive tract is so designed that it can digest any possible mixture of food. So you'll take their word for it and you'll fill up on everything from soup to nuts, including the nuts. And I might say that in doing it, you are also nuts. And then suffer with indigestion with heartburn, with palpitation, with gas eructations, with foul stools, with constipation, with diarrhea, and you'll spend your money for palliative drugs. And I must re again remind you that so long as you can be kept in ignorance and can be kept buying drugs, 
The people who sell you the drugs will try to keep you believing that you can digest any combination of food. Foods are digested by both mechanical and chemical processes. But we do not need to talk about the mechanical portions of the process of digestion this evening. Let us think of the chemical process. We have a series of digestive juices beginning with xylem in the mouth and going on through hydrochloric acid in the stomach, the pancreatic juice, the intestinal juice and bile in the liver that break down the complex food substances that we eat and reduce them to a few very simple substances that can be taken into the bloodstream and can be circulated in the blood and can be taken up by the cells. Oh, I'm sorry, cells are passive things through which food substances flow. And some way or other, the needed food substances cling to the cell. There are the most inactive things in all the universe. If you've studied physiology, I know you'll know what I mean. <clears throat> the cells take up these food, these food elements and incorporate them into themselves. This altogether constitutes the process of nutrition. That is, the transformation of raw materials into flesh and blood and bone and glands and hair and nails and so forth. These Digestive juices alternate between alkalis and acids. Every true digestive juice contains one or more substances that are known as enzymes. Enzymes are the active agencies in instigating the necessary chemical changes in the food substances to reduce them to the simpler substances that can be taken into the bloodstream. Every enzyme has a specific action. By this I mean it acts only upon a particular type of food or food substance. For example, the enzyme in the saliva of the mouth is known as chylin and acts only upon starch. It has no action on sugar. It has no action on protein. It has no action on fat. It acts only on starch. It converts that starch into sugar. When the sugar reaches the small intestines, it is reduced to a still simpler sugar. And it is only the simplest of sugars that enters the bloodstream. You take sugar into your mouth and there's a copious outpouring of saliva. But there's no tylen in it. For the simple reason that tylen does not act upon sugar, so it is not poured out when sugar is eaten. Take starch into your mouth, chew it, Swallow it, you insalivate it, tylen is poured out into, into, with the saliva to digest the starch. You swallow it, it gets into your stomach, and no gastric juice is poured out upon the starch because starch gastric juice has no office in the digestion of starch. The pepsin of the stomach or of the gastric juice acts on proteins and not on anything else. There are two other enzymes in the juice of the stomach. One of them is present only in babyhood, and the other, under our modern methods of eating, at least hasn't any value to us at all. It is known as gastric lipase. It acts upon fat, but it does not act upon fats in the presence of a strong acid. And as we eat our fats, usually with proteins, we destroy our lipase, and we get no fatty digestion in the stomach. So we will ignore that for the time being. Now two points I want to bring to you clearly. Tylen, which acts upon starches, is destroyed by a mild acid. Whether it's the acid that you take with your food, such as oranges and grapefruit and limes and lemons and pineapples and other acid foods, or the vinegar that you put in your salad dressing, or acid drugs that may be given to you by your physician, or the gastric juice of the stomach, which is acid. <clears throat> Acids destroy tylen and prevent the digestion of starch. 
This being true, our first rule in food combining is to eat starches and acid foods at separate meals. But inasmuch as when you eat protein, an acid gastric juice is poured into the stomach to assist in the digestion of the protein, and that acid destroys the tylen, our next rule is to eat your proteins and your starches at separate meals. Now let us go back in history. Let us go back to the time when Moses led the Hebrews out of Egypt, and they wandered to and fro north and south and east and west and back again in the wilderness for some 40 years. If you will remember your story, the tribal deity of the Hebrews had them eating a mono diet. Morning and evening they had manna. Day after day for 40 years they ate manna. Now I can well understand that a diet of that kind eaten day after day for such a long time became rather monotonous. So the Hebrews were continually complaining that they didn't have anything to eat except manna. They are, re are described as having lusted after the flesh pots of Egypt. So on one occasion, we are told there in the, I believe it is in the book of Exodus, <coughs> that the Hebrews were complaining because they didn't have any flesh to eat. So Jehovah said to Moses, he said, Say unto the children of Israel that they shall have flesh in the morning and bread in the evening. It could have been reversed, bread in the evening and flesh in the morning, I'm not positive. A few verses further down in the same chapter, it tells us that they did have their flesh in the morning and their bread in the evening. Here is an example taken from a period more of about 3,000 years ago, showing that the Hebrews of that time ate their proteins and their starches at separate meals. I think it's a very unfortunate thing for the Hebrews that they have adopted a lot of the modern American Gentile practices in their eating habits. <clears throat> but we go to Greece, and we find the same practice in Greece, that of eating their proteins at one meal, their starches at another. And there are still remnants of that eating practice to be seen among the peoples living around the Mediterranean. It is quite probable, and I say that quite probable because the amount of information I have been able to obtain upon this is not sufficient to say that it's quite positive that it happened. It is quite probable, however, that this particular practice was common to mankind all over the earth at one time. Just as we know from the study of eating habits of animals, that if they're given their choice, if their foods are not mixed for them, they will separate their proteins and their starches and eat them at separate meals. Birds will do it. Chickens will do it. Other animals will do it. Of course, there are many animals that also live on mono diets. The meat-eating animal, for example, the carnivore, he lives on a diet of meat or flesh. He has flesh every time he eats. He doesn't mix it with anything, perhaps a little dirt now and then. <clears throat> he isn't afraid of germs, apparently. Now, the wise boys will point out to you that old Mother Nature herself has combined proteins and starches. Yes? You point out that wheat has about 8 to 10 percent protein and about 30 percent starch. And you'll say now, if Mother Nature combines them, why can't we? When you eat a cereal by itself, which is a starch protein combination, the predominant food element in that, star in that cereal, which is starch, will determine the kind of food that is poured out, the kind of juice that is poured out upon it. There will be an abundant supply of, of saliva and tylen poured out upon it to digest the starch. The juice poured into the stomach will be so mildly acid 
that it will not interfere with the action of the Thailand. And this remains true until the cereal, the starch of that cereal is digested. And that means about 80 minutes. After which, an abundance of hydrochloric acid with an abundance, abundance of pepsin will be poured into the stomach and the protein of the cereal will be digested. And this means that when you eat a food that is a starch protein combination and you eat it alone, or you eat it in combinations with other substances that do not interfere with its di digestion, that old Mother Nature, which means your digestive system in this case, is capable of adapting its secretions to the digestive requirements of that particular food, both as to their concentration of acid, of, of acid or alkali, as to their enzymic content, and as to the timing of the pouring out of the juice. But eating a food, that is a starch protein combination, is one thing, and eating foods that are starches and proteins is another. With it all, old Mother Nature never turned out a sandwich. There are three substances that are wholesome substances. They're excellent foods, they're necessary foods. And yet when you take them into your stomach, they inhibit or check, in other words, the secretion of gastric juice so that they... <clears throat> <clears throat> so that they retard the digestion of protein. Thank you. <clears throat> These three substances are sugar, acids, and fats. You don't even have to take fats into the stomach to have them to retard protein digestion. A few spoonfuls of olive oil injected into the rectum in the form of an enema will result in the checking of the secretion of gastric juice in the stomach for two hours. When you eat sweet substances, sugars, syrups, honey, cakes, pies, dates, figs, raisins, and other sweet foods, foods, at the same time that you take proteins, these sugars check the flow of gastric juice. They check the muscular activities of the stomach. They retard protein digestion. And retarded digestion means decomposition. It means indigestion. It means trouble. Acids. Oranges, grapefruits, lemons, limes, pineapples, sour berries, sour grapes, sour apples, other acid foods, vinegar that you may put in your salad dressing. That is, if you're foolish enough to ruin the taste of a good salad by smearing it with that greasy stuff. Both the grease and the acid. Inhibit the outpouring of gastric juice when you put that on there. Fats, sugars, and acids check or inhibit the secretion of gastric juice and retard protein digestion. And this means, in terms of practical use in eating, that we should eat our proteins at separate meals from our sugars, from our fats, and from our acids. And those of you who are still carnivores, beasts of prey, who still love your feast of bull beef and boar steak, I believe will bear me out when I remind you that fat meats are fried meats, 
are much more difficult to digest and take a much longer time than lean meats that have been broiled or baked. Those of you who have not been brought up to bury the dead carcasses of animals in your stomachs will have to depend on the testimony of those who make graveyards of their stomachs for the truth of that remark. But you will find it better in your eating habits to refrain from taking these three types of substances with your proteins. Again, we'll be met with the objection that Mother Nature herself mixes proteins and fat. She does it in nuts. She does it in milk. She does it in the avocado. She does it in the olive. She mixes sugars and fats in the dates. Yes, she does, but here again we have the thing that if you eat these foods themselves without wrongly combining them with other substances that interfere, there is the possibility of adjusting the digestive juices to the re digestive requirements of that food. Do you know that you get your strongest digestive juice in the fourth hour of digestion if you eat nuts? In the fourth hour of digestion, if you, eat, if you take milk, so that you digest, you digest protein food that contain fat at a slower rate and at a later stage in the process of digestion than you do the protein foods that are do devoid of fat. But if you eat them alone, or if you eat them with an abundance of green vegetables which do not interfere with their digestion and which has, a, has the effect of counteracting the inhibiting effect of fat upon the gastric secretions, then you will have better digestion. The same thing with your fat, with your starches. They should be combined not with acids, which interfere with their digestion, not with sugars, which interfere with the outpouring of tylen in the mouth, not with proteins, which cause the outpouring of a highly acid gastric juice in the stomach and suspend gastric, gastric digestion, but with green vegetables, Raw, cooked, or both, but plenty of green vegetables. A big salad, and I mean a tub full of it, should form the most important part of at least one meal a day, and a, half, a salad half that size of the other meal. One meal a day should be a fruit. Now our, our chairman here, who sat idly by and let the previous speaker speak about three times as long as he was rescheduled for, just notified me that my time is up. So I'm going to bow to the will of the chairman and give you an opportunity to see the picture. Is vitamin E conducive to healing a damaged heart? I know this is like waving a red flag in front of my friend, Dr. Shelton. I'll try to keep on my red temper in this case. <clears throat> I, I'll have to answer that question in the light of my own experience. I don't believe I've had more than one or two heart cases in my institution in the past 10 years that hadn't previously had vitamin E for the heart. And I haven't seen any evidence, nor I've received any history of any improvement in the heart from taking it. Now, I don't know anything in sunflower seed or sunflower seed oil that can heal anything. Healing is a biological process. It takes place within the body. It is, a bo it is a body process. It is something that is going on 
day by day, every day of your life, from the minute, from the very first minute, that there was the slightest deviation in your organism from the highest standard of health which old Mother Nature herself recognizes to the present time and is still going on, it goes on under all kinds of conditions. And the only reason that it is not successful is that you keep building the disease day by day by a mode of living that violates every law of life. The lady wants to know if it is advisable to use lemon oil and honey in salads. Now, in the first place, honey is the finest food in the world for bees. The only kind of honey I like wears skirts or shorts and walks around on two legs. As a matter of fact, my favorite food combination is a date with a peach. <laughs> honey is a sugar. Lemon juice is an acid. Take it on your salad and then eat your salad with proteins or starches. And immediately you run into wrong combinations. I advise you to eat your salads without dressings of any kind. Learn to relish the fine, delicate flavors with which old Mother Nature has savored her foods. When once you have done so, they couldn't drive you back to eating salt and sauces and dressings on your salads or, the, or your other foods with a bullwhip. Uh, the speaker in the rear misunderstood what I said. I said that I had not had more than two cases that had not had vitamin E. I did not say that I only had two heart cases. Not more than two that had not been previously treated with vitamin E. I will make this further remark. Any man who has lived to the age he has lived and has read, if he's read the newspapers, during that time in the magazines and perhaps books and seen the numerous reports from medical institutions, hospitals, research institutions, and so forth about their marvelous cures of thousands of cases with their various cures they have developed, used enthusiastically and discarded during his lifetime and who can still put credence in anything they say is really very credulous. think that she has me mixed up with some other Dr. Shelton. Does he look like him? <laughs> <laughs> she wants to know if I have changed my mind about whether or not it is all right if you eat fruits and vegetables to mix them in any way you want to. I, I haven't changed my mind in a number of years about that because I never had the idea that they could be mixed indiscriminately. There are certain fruits and vegetables that can be eaten together, and there are certain ones that cannot be eaten together without trouble. I will say that in hygienic circles, this battle between fruits and vegetables, whether or not they can be mixed at the same meal, has been going on for at least a hundred years. And there are yet some differences of opinion on the matter. Katie wants to know if I think that a person with high blood pressure may safely eat nuts because of the fat that it contains. Let me say in the first place that she's trying to mix hygiene and medicine. I would advise all of you to stop trying it. They don't mix. It's like trying to mix water and oil. Let's either stick to hygiene or go back to the pill box and the medicine bottle and shake well before taking and all that. Don't get your information from medical sources. Right now, they are making a big fuss about eating fats causing high blood pressure and heart disease. Five years from now, they'll be telling you that something else is causing high blood pressure and something else is causing heart disease. And if you live a little longer, they'll have another fad that they'll follow. They have never stuck to anything long enough for it to 
get dry behind the ears. Now they tell you that fat, certain fats cause high blood pressure, they cause hardening of the arteries, they cause heart disease, but in their own words, in their own findings, they have discovered that this does not take place in a man who does plenty of physical activity. I would say to you, forget all the medical nonsense that you read in the newspapers and magazines because two years from now you'll be reading something else. They have not a single valid principle to work upon. It's a hit-and-miss system. It's a case of, if this theory doesn't work, we'll try another one. Just like if this drug doesn't work, we'll try another one. For 3,000 years, they've been carrying on that program. This man wants to know what is the cause of epileptic seizures. He says that doctors, and I know that he means physicians, not doctors, but physicians. A physician is a man who is skilled in or learned in the art of drugging, physics, the art of physicking the patient. They tell him to take uh, delantine and it will help the druggist. I mean, he didn't add that. It'll help the drug manufacturers, nobody else. There are no poisons from any source or of any nature that can take, be taken into your body that can give you the slightest assistance or help in anything. This is a superstition that we inherited from a long time ago. It seems to me that it's about time for us awake, to wake up to the fact that it is just a superstition. Epilepsy begins as a nerve impairment, innervation. The innervation results in toxemia. The toxemia grows. The nervous system becomes worse and worse. Some trouble develops, such as a, a irritation along the digestive tract, tonsillar troubles, tumor of the womb, or something of that kind, that results in local irritation of the nervous system that dissolves nervous control. These conditions can be remedied, not just helped, by eliminating or removing the cause that has produced and is maintaining the trouble and by building up the nerve structure and the general health of the body by the means that I outlined for you in last evening's lecture. 